Karen Cruz Thomas, historian of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. The school was founded in 1916 with a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation as the world's first independent graduate school of public health. This year, we're celebrating our centennial with a series of monthly lunch and learn talks on different aspects of the history of the school. Today's talk, the first in the series of 10, is on William Henry Welch and the dynamic science of public health. Each talk will be posted to our YouTube channel about one week after the live event. You can watch them at jhsph.edu slash centennial. Thanks so much for joining us to celebrate the centennial of the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. Let me go ahead and get started. So these are, are some images of, of William Henry Welch that tell you a little bit about each aspect of his personality. So he was a, both a pathologist and a bacteriologist, uh, very highly trained, and he was, was coming into science in the, in the 1870s and 80s, which was really the golden age of bacteriology and, and the discovery of the uh, microbi microbes that caused disease. Um, he himself discovered uh, a bacterial organism that causes gas, gangrene. So uh, that, that is one of his contributions. Uh, he, he came to Baltimore in 1883 and the, the uh, the university had already begun to talk about uh, founding a medical school, but first they founded the hospital, which opened in 1886. And he was involved in, in the planning from the very beginning. And Welch was the first faculty uh, uh, brought on to the Johns Hopkins Medical School, School of Medicine. Uh, and he also was the first dean of the school. So a lot of our model of public health um, is in part related to what Welch did at the School of Medicine. Uh, but before he came to the School of Medicine, he had been to Munich, Germany, and traveled around Europe. Um, because at that time, there was very little graduate uh, research education available in the United States. So you really had to go to Europe to do that. So he went to Max von Pettenkoffer's uh, Institute, Institute of Hygiene in, in Munich, Germany. And what he saw there was what he fell in love with and wanted to bring back to the United States. So the Institutes of Hygiene in Germany were uh, supported by the government uh, and they, um, I would say that hygiene is as close to you know the the antecedent of the, of today's National Institutes of Health, it focused on scientific research to advance human health, um, but also it was also very environmental. It was looking into the environmental causes of disease, and that's what the science of bacteriology was was very focused on. So here is Welch uh, with his microscope. Um, Welch, when he, when he was a, a younger man still studying bacteriology. And this is uh, a famous cartoon of Welch. Um, these are his many famous students whom he trained while he was uh, chair of bacteriology and pathology at uh, the School of Medicine. So uh, it's just kind of a pun on Welsh rabbit. So by the time the School of Hygiene was founded. This is actually not, I'm sorry, I missed, there we go. Uh, messed my slide up a little bit. By the time uh, the School of Hygiene was, was about to be founded, um, Welch had been dean of the medical school from 1893 until 1897, so the first four years. And then he had continued to um, teach, uh, he mentored uh, dozens of scientists um, who went, went on to do uh, amazing work themselves. But by 1915, Welch was older 
And he had really branched out quite a bit. He had, uh, he was involved in, uh, he was on the board of the US Hygienic Laboratory of the Public Health Service, uh, which was dedicated to um, both epidemiological field work, but also, you know, examining, uh, for instance, the early, some of the early work on hookworm was done at the hygienic laboratory. So, he, and he, while he was in Maryland, he also was president of the Maryland Board of Hygiene. Um, and so he had uh, very wide ranging interests and contributions to public health beyond just the basic sciences. Uh, one of my favorite contributions of Welch <laughs> is um, Maryland farmers really loved William Henry Welch. Um, and they talked about him for decades afterwards because he saved their hogs. Um, there was an epidemic of hog cholera in the 18, I think late 1880s. And Welch uh, basically went out onto the farms in rural Maryland and figured out what was causing the hogs to get sick and determined that it was hog cholera and um, you know, told the farmers to like isolate the animals and prevent the disease from spreading. But um, it, it, you know, looking through his correspondence, it was amazing to me that people were still writing to him and referring to that you know, 30 years later. Um, so, in 1915, by that time, uh, departments of public health had been established for several decades, but um, there were as yet no schools of public health. So the Rockefeller Foundation had already uh, established itself as the main patron of medical research and medical education in the United States. But public health leaders, uh, including Welch, but also Wycliffe Rose, who had led the Rockefeller hookworm campaign in the South, uh, uh, sorry, uh, other leaders um, from, especially from New York State and the New York City Public Health Department, were, were pushing for a separate profession of public health. Uh, and so the Welch Rose Report was based on a, a 20 member commission, but Welch and Rose were the ones chosen to write the report. So they said in 1915 that the most urgent need in medical education and public health work was to establish an independent school of public health. So that's how much emphasis that they put on, on this idea. And Welch especially, wanted the school to have at its very center an institute of hygiene, like the one that he had seen in, music, in, in Munich so many years ago, to do what he called cultivate the science of hygiene. Now, some historians, uh, my predecessor is Elizabeth Fee, who wrote the book Disease and Discovery, have been somewhat critical of Welch and have said that he really emphasized basic science and didn't pay enough attention to practice and things like public health administration. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So we have the ideal of both hygiene and public health, and I'm gonna talk about how they were different, but also how I, I believe Welch really reconciled them. So of course, our school was named the School of Hygiene and public health. And Elizabeth Fee says that, well, they put hygiene first, so that shows you where their priorities were. And I think, you know, that's, that's possibly true. Uh, but let's look a little bit about what hygiene and public health meant. So at the, in the early 20th century, the terms hygiene, public health, uh, sanitation, all of those things were being used pretty interchangeably. But as I've said, Hygiene, in part, came from the German idea, and it really is talking about environmental health and also the basic sciences to examine uh, the, the diseases that are coming out of the environment. Um, so sanitary chemistry and the physiology of uh, human interaction with uh, temperature, humidity, uh, ventilation, uh, light, and, and figuring out um, 
how our surroundings affect human health. And that was especially relevant, for instance, in schools and in workplaces and in hospitals, so anywhere that there's an institutional setting. And hygiene also, however, meant uh, popular health advice. And then it also meant personal cleanliness. So there were a lot of different meanings to hygiene, and it didn't always just mean basic science. Now, public health was uh, more based on a British mo model. And uh, in Britain, health officers, uh, each county in, in Britain had its own health officer. Uh, and public health in Britain was very focused on administration and a broad social approach to public health. So here at the school, we sometimes talk about uh, from the uh, microscopic to the population level. So hygiene dealt you know, with the microscopic and public health dealt with the, the social population level. Now, having said all these things, you know, we, we have uh, the hygiene piece, but we also had the public health piece. Uh, Welch brought his friend Sir Arthur Newsholm who had helped set up this British public health system uh, to be, be the first uh, chair of public health administration. And uh, Sir Arthur was basically, he was a socialist. Uh, he really wanted um, to broaden government control of not only public health services, but medical care in general. Um, and his ideas would be picked up uh, later in the 20th century by a lot of the people who wanted to bring about national health insurance. Uh, so he taught here for a, for a few years, uh, but then he went back to Britain and wrote his memoir. And, uh, so another way to look at, at the concept of hygiene is to look at the different names of, of the institutions that were being formed. So I've, I've mentioned uh, Max von Petenkoffer, uh, and his Institute of Hygiene was founded in 1865. So Pettenkoffer is really the father of hygiene or the science of public health. And Welch can be said in some ways to be the American version of, of Pettenkoffer. Um, the Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania State Board of Health, as, as you can see on this chart, were, were very active in public health. And uh, the Board of Health starts in, as early as 1884, putting out um, a, it's a bulletin, uh, the Annals of Hygiene. And it has information about um, how to keep the milk supply uh, free of disease and how to um, you know, raise children to be healthy. And so it's, pop, it's partly popular health information, but it's also uh, meant for health officers. It talks about health statistics. Um, it, in some ways, it's, it's a continuing education for health officers that, that enables them to you know, keep up with the latest things in, in public health. So that's the Annals of Hygiene. Um, 1892, you know, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, uh, jumped, jumped us by a good bit um, when they founded their laboratory of hygiene. And interestingly, uh, John Shaw Billings, uh, who had been at Johns Hopkins, uh, went to Penn to be the first director of their uh, laboratory of hygiene. And Billings, like Welch, um, was a very uh, broad-ranging person who not only was he head of this Institute of Hygiene, at Laboratory of Hygiene, he also uh, was head of the Philadelphia um, Health Department. So, you know, the practice and the science were really pretty closely integrated even early on. Um, I find it very interesting that in the AMA constitution that they adopted in 1901, uh, part of their mission, they say, is enlightening and directing public opinion in regard to the broad problems of hygiene. So that's how they are framing it uh, back in 1901. So Pennsylvania also jumped us on awarding the, the first degree in public health, which uh, was a doctor of public hygiene. Um, so the idea of public hygiene kind of are, is that they're already combining public health and hygiene even back then. 
And of course, we have our, in our own state of Maryland, we have the Maryland Board of Mental Hygiene. Uh, Welch founds the American Journal of Hygiene, which is very much a scientific journal and not a popular education sort of journal. And then in 1921, uh, we award the first Doctor of Science in Hygiene degree. So that's kind of a, um, a quick look at how that term hygiene was being used at the time. So Welch, as I said, um, was, was a consummate basic scientist. Uh, he had been chair of both uh, pathology and bacteriology at the School of Medicine. And in the school that he was founding director of uh, here, he created the first uh, department of immunology in the world and also uh, the first department of virology um, under Charles Simon in 1922. So some of the first academic units in major basic sciences were started here at the school. Um, we also had uh, departments of physiological hygiene, which I talked about a minute ago, with um, you know the the effects of of the ambient environment on individual uh, people uh, in work and living environments, um, and about half, I believe, five of the original eight departments of the school were basic science departments. So that's obviously very important um, just in the structure of the school. Uh, I don't know, you, you can kind of go back and forth if you count uh, parasitology as a basic science or not. It involves both field work and uh, laboratory work under the microscope, but um, it was certainly a key part of the school as well. And because we had been founded by the same uh, philanthropy that was funding the hookworm campaign in the South, we did a lot of research on hookworms. And in fact, there is a sample uh, jar in the basement parasitology teaching lab here that is uh, liver flukes. It's a, a type of um, parasitic helminth that, uh, so those, that jar is, is from 1917 on a trip to China that, um, William W. Court, the, the chair of um, helminthology, made, made to China for the Rockefeller Foundation. So, you know, we still have uh, evidence of, of this work here, and we're still using it uh, to show students. So I have this image from Time Magazine in 1923 up because despite this very heavy emphasis, emphasis on laboratory sciences at the school, Welch was also um, very involved in public health practice and, um, and in the mental hygiene movement, which had uh, very much um, had strong roots here at Johns Hopkins with Adolf Meyer, the first chair of psychiatry uh, at the School of Medicine. And so Welch was um, involved in, uh, in bringing Meyer to the medical school uh, and he also served as chair of the, the first voluntary organization uh, to uh, advocate for mental health patients, uh, which was founded, I believe, in, well, in the early 1900s. However, we did not have an actual department of mental hygiene. We didn't have a, a division in, in that field until 1941 uh, because there were just too many other things going on, I suppose. So another way to look at this hygiene public health uh, tension or, or challenge is to look at the degrees that we founded. And I think there, there was equal weight given to the hygiene piece, which if you look at the lower part of the table, this, there, were, there were scientific research degrees in hygiene and you could get either a master or a doctor of science in hygiene. Um, and those degrees were for non-physicians. They were for scientists. And one of the interesting things about Johns Hopkins is that um, most other schools of public health were not stressing science in the same way that we were. 
And in fact, we were the only school of public health in, until well after World War II to require bacteriology for all of our students. Um, and when the National Research Council begins awarding graduate fellowships in the sciences, which is one of the most prestigious fellowships that you can get, um, two or three of our students get those fellowships um, the very first year they're awarded. So that, and you know, our faculty are publishing in science and in the major scientific heavy hitting journals. No other school of public health is doing it, that at, at this time. Um, so we are also, however, uh, awarding degrees in, in the public health aspects. Uh, we are awarding professional degrees that are training physicians for public health leadership. And another thing that Welch does, although he creates these programs to train research scientists, he holds up the ideal of the physician health officer as really the model for public health professional degree programs. And that's very different from a lot of other schools who are training nurses, sanitary engineers, uh, people in social, science, uh, social sciences, social workers. Um, so our school is, is very uh, monolithic, very focused on physicians for the first at least 50 years of its, exi its existence. And then we later do branch out. So to, to give you an idea of, of how, uh, I would say, chaotic things were in the early years, these are the degrees that are awarded and what year they first awarded a degree. Um, if you look at the third column, the divisions, uh, most of the schools, but certainly not all of them, were uh, awarding these degrees from the medical school. And uh, although there were degree programs in existence, um, there were no separate, dedicated, independent faculties with their own admission requirements uh, in existence until our school was founded in 1916. But people were giving degrees, and you can also notice uh, the tuition on the right <laughs> is really, really low. <laughs> so, you, you know, just the variety of different names, the certified sanitarian, the doctor of public hygiene, or the master of public health, certificate of public health, uh, master of science in public health. So. You can see, if, if you may notice, there's a little asterisk next to just three of the degrees. So those are the only three that admit non-physicians to that degree program. And all the rest of those degrees are specifically set aside for physicians. So the other thing I wanted to point out is the, the way that our school became a model in many ways for the rest of the world, uh, for schools of public health all around the world. So there was no uh, federal grants available for schools of public health, and there's really no other types of funding except for the Rockefeller Foundation. So all of the schools on this list, with the exception of, if you look at 1922, the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons founds the Delamar Institute. Um, that's the only school that was founded with something other than a Rockefeller Foundation grant. So Henry Delamar gave money to found that institute in 1922. So you can see that you know uh, Rockefeller is really the gorilla in the room at the time, um, and that you know in the very names of these schools, uh, they are modeling themselves on the School of Hygiene and Public Health. Um, so for instance, in 1932, down at the very bottom, uh, our sister school is. Uh, the All India Institute of Hygiene and Public Health, founded in Calcutta, is the first school of public health founded in uh, South or Southeast Asia. Now, uh, the the school of public uh, the school of hygiene curriculum was basically uh, taken and transplanted over to China by John Black Grant, um, one of our very first graduates. Um, he had been a medical missionary in China and spoke fluent Chinese, um, came here and got a doctor of public health in 1921. And then he became the first chair of uh, public health and preventative medicine at the Peking Union Medical College. So like our current dean, Mike Clagg, William Henry Welch, at the same time that he was a very busy guy, 
Um, at the same time that Welch was uh, helping to write the Welch Rose Report, he was also serving on the China Medical Board of the Rockefeller Foundation and going to China to found a new medical school that became known as the Hopkins of the East. But within that medical school, there is a unit for public health and preventive medicine, and our school supplies many of the faculty for that uh, unit. And uh, Chinese students come to the school to get trained, and they go back and serve on the faculty. And that's the pattern at a lot of these schools. They send uh, natives of their countries to come learn in Baltimore, and then they go back and become uh, the faculty members, the ministers of health, et cetera. And that's really uh, one of the main purposes of all these Rockefeller grants. Um, they want to train people in the United States, bring them back, and continue establishing the same kind of model all around the world. Um, I know this is a lot of text, and all I can say is, you know, go check this out later when you have more time. But if you just kind of scan through this list, um, the argument that William Henry Welch uh, was so focused on basic science that he didn't allow enough uh, emphasis on practice is pretty much uh, uh, debunked by, by our graduates. When you look at what our graduates did, it's, it's astonishing. Um, we had uh, you know, the founding director of the first public health school in Brazil. Uh, the Executive Sec Secretary of the American Public Health As Association. Um, I mentioned John Black Grant uh, just now, and he's not only does he head the public health department at Peking Union, he also becomes director of the All India Institute as well. Um, so these are all people trained here at the school, and um, many of our graduates go into the military and become uh, national and international figures during World War II. Um, I think one of our most interesting graduates is Paul R. Hawley, who becomes the first medical director of the, of the Veterans Administration and then goes on to head Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and then, uh, because he hasn't done enough already, he becomes director of the American College of Surgeons. So, you know, these are people who are, are, are uh, titans in both public health and medicine and medical education uh, in the United States and uh, in other countries. So uh, another, uh, you know, this kind of later group of, of graduates, um, Anna Bacher, um, not only teaches here for 60 years, she becomes president of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. Um, we have uh, several directors of the Pan American Health Organization because we were very focused on Latin America in the early years. And I want to point out the two guys in the middle, Fred Soper and Justin Andrews, um, head of PAHO and head of CDC and National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, they really run the early malaria control campaigns and reduce the number of cases and deaths of, from malaria by the millions. So Andrews is in the American South. Uh, um, controlling malaria um, through environmental methods, um, draining swamps, and applying insecticides uh, in breeding grounds in the American South. Um, and then he kind of cleans up the, the final job uh, during World War II with a malaria control in war areas program. And then Fred Soper, who's also trained. So Fred Soper is a DRPH graduate, and Andrews is an S. S Doctor of Science and Hygiene graduate, and they're both um, out there in the world helping to control malaria, um, working with the military during World War II, and working with the major uh, international health organizations after the war. Uh, we've got a Surgeon General, um, a Director of Education for, and Training for WHO. Um, so, it, and then we have our very first dean who has an MPH, Ernest Stebbins. Um, and he comes to us from what was then the premier public health position in the country, other than Surgeon General. He was health commissioner of New York City. And he complained to Abel Woolman, chair of sanitary engineering here, that um, he couldn't get a clean glass of water in New York City and wanted Abel Woolman to help him uh, take care of that problem. 
So let's go back to this ideal of the physician health officer. Uh, as other schools of public health were being established around the country, um, not only William Welch, but his successors as dean uh, were emphasizing that, that schools of public health needed to be graduate level reserved for physicians. And that's the part of, of the legacy that's, that's contested. Um, obviously, many other schools of public health did not follow that model. But that was the Hopkins model. It was very much based in the strength of the medical school here. Um, and it continues to shape our school because we are still the school of public health with the highest percentage of physicians. But what, what he did was to really forge a permanent link between medicine and public health that had, that had not necessarily been there before. Um, health departments in, you know, before our school was founded were run by physicians who were mainly interested in private practice and the health department was a very part-time sideline and they were political appointees who honestly weren't super invested in the departments of public health. Um, so bringing public health into the realm of medicine and really mixing those two things together elevated the prestige of public health and also gave us a very strong scientific evidence base. And I think that has uh, made public health what it is today and saved public health from really going by the wayside. Um, and it is not only essential, you know, the, the scientific method and using strong standards of evidence is important in the basic sciences, but it's also important in policy. And that's what our school does really, really well, both of those things. So in Hopkins, when you have people leading the school like William Henry Welch or Mike Clagg, um, there's, you know, there's more of a, a coming together of equals. But in other universities, um, Elizabeth Fee has written that uh, bringing medical and public health education together uh, cause public health to be really submerged in the powerful interests of academic medicine. Now that's a criticism that was actually made of Harvard and Columbia in their early years um, because both of those schools were really run out of the medical school until uh, after World War II. Um, so the Rockefeller Foundation was very critical of Harvard School of Public Health and said that, you know, you guys are, are letting the doctors just run all over you and, and you're not um, you're not being independent, you're not doing real public health work, um, you're mainly training MD students in preventive medicine, so we're gonna give more money to Hopkins. Um, so this ideal, however, um, goes into decline during the 20th century. So in 1950, like before World War II, like a very large percentage of the professional degrees in schools of public health were uh, enrolling MDs. But by 1950, of all of the enrollments in schools of public health, about 41% are MDs. And then by 1970, it's 19%. I honestly don't have current figures, but I'm guessing it's, it's either 19% or probably a lot lower than that. So um, I will try to follow up on that. Um, so I've, I've been talking about these tensions and some conflicts, but also a lot of collaboration between um, hygiene, basic science, a more NIH model of scientific research, and then public health. So maybe a more CDC model, uh, getting out into the community, using social sciences, addressing prevention on a population level. Um, what Welch really gave us is that he understood public health is always evolving and changing toward new understandings and methods of both preventing disease, which is what he was trying to do with his uh, bacteriology and pathology work, but also promoting health. And that, in many ways, is more of a, a social and behavioral uh, enterprise. So, Welch was a, was a central advisor for the Rockefeller Foundation. And between 1913 and 1951, 
uh, the Rockefeller Foundation gave a quarter of a billion dollars, and I think that's about 10 or $12 billion today. Remember, this is from one foundation. Um, for William Welch and uh, his student, uh, Simon Flexner, Flexner's model of medical and public health research. So the Rockefeller Institute of Medical Reser Research, um, you know, our school, uh, the schools that were aided after the 1910 Flexner report um, that really brings uh, modern clinical medicine uh, into existence. Um, before the Flexner report in 1910, uh, a lot of medical schools were what, what were called diploma mills. And you could get a, it wasn't quite uh, mail your box top in, but you spent about six weeks, there were no labs, you just sat in a room with lectures, and then you got an MD, and then you were done. Um, so Welch and Flexner really dramatically changed American medicine and American public health and made uh, public health just as research oriented as they made medicine. Now by 1948, um, our only dean who has ever been a non-MD, uh, biostatistician, Lowell Reed, uh, said in 1948 that public health is becoming more and more a social science. Now one of the reasons that he said that is because the main causes of death, even by 1948, were no longer the infectious diseases that have responded so well to those bacteriological methods. Find the bacteria, figure out what kills it, and zap it with a magic bullet. That model is not working so well, even by 1948. Um, so Welch's ideas really come under fire. Uh, so the Rockefeller Foundation annual report in 1951, you know, this is, this is uh, Welch's foundation that he had shaped so strongly. By 1951, even they are saying, the old idea that biophysics and biochemistry would eventually unravel all the problems of health and disease is less tenable today than was the case 40 or 50 years ago. So um, what, what do we do with this? Uh, obviously, I think our school is living proof that the basic sciences did not go away. Um, the NIH really takes over from the Rockefeller Foundation after World War II in funding. I mean, the Rockefeller model lived on in the NIH, but um, Welch's ideas definitely endure. He gave us the idea that science is the primary engine of progress in public health, and that's science in a very broad sense. Um, Surgeon General Thomas Perrin, who was Surgeon General from 1936 to 48, uh, said that public health is a dynamic science. And I think he was really echoing William Welch here. Sickness and death rates of previous years are inadequate yardsticks for the present and utterly useless as goals for the future. I could see Mike Clagg saying that. Um, and the other idea Welch gave us is that scientific rigor is in the best interests of public health. And our own uh, Jonathan Samet, who is chair of epidemiology here, and Tom Burke, um, who until very recently was our associate dean of uh, public health practice and training, uh, they uh, published an article in 2001 that said that epidemiologists who are conducting research, particularly research with policy implications, need to use adequate quality control and be cognizant of the scrutiny that their data will receive, especially considering that the federal, federal policy now requires us to share data <laughs> from all of our research. So that connection between scientific rigor and policy, I think, is, is very much a heritage of William Henry Welch as well. So I'm going to end with, with a prediction. Uh, I think that the, the dynamic science in the 21st century uh, is, is going to be system science methods. And these, these methods, and for instance, uh, Bruce Lee is using those kinds of methods to study obesity. Now, I think that there are many different disciplines and departments in the school that can make a very valid claim for being 
the future of public health in the 21st century. But I picked this particular one because it's so broad ranging and it can, you know, it can bring in lots of different disciplines the way Welch's basic science uh, scientific methods did. And he, uh, he really wove together public health administration, epidemiology, the basic sciences, environmental health, all of those things, but they were united by this scientific rigor and building evidence uh, to base our conclusions on. So that's my talk. Um, I've en enjoyed it, and uh, I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Bronze, mm -hmm. correct. Yeah, well, um, Welch was chair of bacteriology and, and pathology, and Howell was the first chair of uh, physiology in the medical school. And he made uh, major contributions to the physiology of blood um, so he was also basically a hematologist, um, but and, and he you know he was studying blood gases and the chemical composition of blood and things like that. And um, so when when Welch was ready to found the School of Hygiene, um, he immediately tapped uh, Howell because he felt that that physiology within the medical school, other than bacteriology was the, the basic science that was gonna be the most relevant to public health. So uh, Howell is the assistant director of the school from the beginning, and he, he and Welch are, are the pair who really, they are the ones who organized the school and decided the structure of the departments and uh, continued to ask the Rockefeller Foundation for more money um, and he also uh, was chair of physiological hygiene. So you just add hygiene on the end and you've got public health. And you know it was a lab department, but um, his daughter, uh, Janet Howell Clark, uh, was one of the very first female faculty members at the school. And she did research on ultraviolet radiation. This was back in the 20s and 30s. And I think one of her very interesting ideas was that um, children need sufficient sunlight to be healthy, because this was back in the days when, when uh, E.B. McCollum was doing research to show that rickets could be prevented by either vitamin D and cod liver oil or sunlight, because sunlight, you know, uh, most kids today uh, from staying inside so much are vitamin D deficient, by the way. So Janet Howell, was talking about how to build classrooms with large enough windows so that there would be light coming in so that the children could stay healthy. So I think it's really interesting. Um, so, and the other thing that I really think William Henry, William Henry Howell did, um, if you wanna be a leader at the early school, you had to be a William Henry, apparently. Um, so, was train Anna Bacher and give her, but grudgingly, a chance to be on the faculty. So he basically said, you know, uh, if you can take the lowest salary we have and go do your own thing without too much supervision, I guess I'll let you on. He wasn't exactly encouraging, but she took the ball and ran with it. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. Enjoyed it.